Welcome to episode number 146 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for jumping on today's episode. Today, my guest is me. This is a very rare occurrence where I've actually just recorded a solo episode of the podcast. This episode was sparked, well, I, I should say, this. these are the concepts in this episode are things that I've been working on for years. Some of the stuff I share in this episode are things that I wrote about six years ago, some are things I wrote about four years ago, and some things I wrote about two years ago. I, I, during the very early phase of COVID, I thought I was going to I was gonna put together like a short little book about the philosophy of reptile keeping or my philosophy of reptile keeping, and I never ended up finishing it, and I just I don't think it's the great a great medium to share content. But recently, there's been some comments on my YouTube channel where people just kind of getting stuck in that ethical conundrum of whether or not it's even proper or moral to keep reptiles in captivity. And because of that, I I thought, you know, I have to share the stuff that I've been writing for so long and just get it out there and share it with you guys and have you guys interact with it and add your own opinions and thoughts about it as well. So this episode really lays out my opinion on reptile keeping, why my opinions on reptile keeping has changed over the years, some of the moral issues I've contended with over time and how I've developed a philosophy that I believe makes reptile keeping moral, but you will be the judge of that. Let's jump into the episode. Well, this is obviously more of a rare occurrence when it comes to the podcast, but I kind of had this feeling that I should record a solo podcast. And for those who are watching on the video, Yes, I have a mustache. We're, I work at a university and we're doing a thing for November, so that's the, the reason for the mustache. For those who are not li- are just listening on audio, then you can save yourself from having to look at that. And I have a feeling that this is not going to be an episode that I can record in one sitting because I think it's going to take me some time to sort of think things out and lay things out. So if you are watching, this will probably seem like different days, different clothes, doesn't matter. I'm trying to lay this out, sort of like writing an essay in a way, and uh, I'm not going to be able to do it in one shot. I'm just going to say that right off the top. So let's see how it goes. We're going to start with a few things that I want to start, you know, sort of define what this podcast is going to be about, and, and then we'll go from there. So I think there is a very common question people have, and, and this is sort of the foundation of the channel, is, is it ethical to keep reptiles? And I think there, you know, I bet 95% of people who keep reptiles don't interact with that question at all because you can imagine a ton of people who keep reptiles just have one reptile at home. They probably got it as a birthday gift as a kid and hopefully they're still taking good care of it, but they don't really interact with herpetoculture on a greater scale. They just sort of have their animal and truck along. And that's a huge majority of people. And including myself, there was a long time where I just had one crested gecko for probably 10 years or so. I just had one crested gecko, took really good care of him, but didn't go on any online forums, YouTube, none of that. I mean, a lot of that didn't exist, you know, 15 years ago or so, but I I, I was just, I cared for my reptile and that was it. And I think there's a lot of people like that. And then there's other people in the hobby who, this is more of that, it's my right to do whatever I want. So I don't care if you think it's ethical or not, I'm going to keep reptiles. So there's that group of people as well, which I think is sort of a, definitely a minority. And then there's people who think they look at the animals, they appreciate the beauty of all the species that are in herpetoculture or in the world in general, and they think, is it right to be keeping these animals in a box? And that is a very, very valid question, and it's a question that I think every reptile keeper ought to contend with at some point in their keeping career, we'll call it. And it doesn't have to be something that you have an answer for right away. But I think as a community, it is paramount that we have an answer for that question. And it's not to have an answer for that question so we can fight up against our animal rights opponents and just say, hey, this is why we keep reptiles. It's more so we owe it to the animals to make sure that we have a good answer, not only have a good answer for that question, but then are acting out what it means to have a good answer for that question. So hopefully we're, I'm going to explain or expand on some of this. Again, I'll, I've written some of this down, so I'll be referencing some of my, my notes here that I have on my desk. And But I think a lot of it will be just kind of off the top. These are ideas that I've been thinking about for a long time. I, if you've been listening to the show, you know that. And we'll just see how it unfolds. And yeah, let, let's just go from there. So the first thing I want to say is this podcast, this episode is not a guide for how to take care of reptiles. 
This is a guide for how to think about caring for reptiles, which is a big difference. You know, a lot of times on the podcast, we're not getting into the nitty gritty of husbandry and care and whatnot. This, the podcast in general is generally about what we can do as keepers to better the, in, to better the lives of the animals that we keep. And that's really what this episode is going to focus on, how to care or how to think about caring for your reptiles. And that might be an overcomplicated thing for some people. People might think, well, re- keeping reptiles is simple water, food, keep their enclosures clean, keep their environments clean. And you're, that's all you really need to do. You don't need to go beyond that. But personally, I think it is so important that we have some kind of guiding philosophy that's, that's walking us through what we're doing with the animals. If if you don't have a more in-depth concept of keeping reptiles, then it, I think it can be very hard to make, to, to know that you're doing things ethically because you're just sort of going through the motions. And I, I don't think there's any hiding the the ethical implications or just the moral implications of keeping quote unquote wild animals in captivity. There's no way around that concept and we shouldn't hide from it. I think many com- parts of our community hide from that and just say, these are captive animals. It doesn't matter. We can do what we want. And But there's a whole bunch of us that say, well, we should look at this a little bit deeper. And that's why I talk about this guiding philosophy. I think it is it is so important that we all have a similar, we're moving on a similar path that's guided by a philosophy. You can imagine if you were just driving in an unknown city and you didn't have a map, then you have nowhere to go. You have no direction to turn. You don't know where you're supposed to go because you have no map. And a guiding philosophy is really a map. It's a map to make sure that you are doing things thoroughly and intentionally and purposefully. And those might all be the same the same thing. But the, the point is, is that you want to know that what you're doing with your animals at home is not only beneficial for those specific animals, but also beneficial for the animals on a whole and even beneficial for the society as a whole, which is quite a grandiose statement. But to defend the hobby, to defend our perp- the purpose of keeping reptiles and amphibians, I'm just going to say reptiles a lot because it's a lot easier, but when I say reptiles, I mean amphibians as well, and really any of these like specialty or sort of exotic animals. It is, it is just so important that we can prove to the people who are not engaged in this hobby that we have value. So as far as I'm concerned, this guiding philosophy has to take into account, of course, the animals, as I already mentioned, their lives that you, the lives of the animals that you keep, the lives and the natural habitat of their wild counterparts. That's crucial. We need to take it into consideration breeders, keepers, pet stores, reptile shops, the industry in whole, it, it, is a, it is a massive industry, both small and large business, the small keepers, the casual keepers, the, the intense hobbyists who, I wouldn't consider myself an intense hobbyist, but people who keep maybe like 30 to 40 animals who are those at the pinnacle of animal care or the pinnacle of breeding a specific species, you know, that might be an intense hobbyist. I just sort of made that up, but I think you guys know what I mean. This, this philosophy needs to, encou- to encompass everything because we can't fractionate and go off on all of our own directions and you know the keepers can't leave the breeders behind and the breeders can't keep the keepers behind and we always know that there's infighting between those groups and again i want to stress that this is not this is not an attempt to justify reptile keeping for the sake of keeping that that is is, is just so important that i make that point clear if if we came to the conclusion that doing all of what we're doing with our animals in captivity was unethical and unmoral or immoral I would have to find a way to remove myself from this hobby. So obviously these animals are already in captivity. I'm sort of burdened to them at this point. And I think my obligation is to make sure that they have a a healthy life from now till the time that they die. But if I couldn't figure out an ethical or moral grounds to stand on, then it wouldn't I, I couldn't possibly exist in this this community. And I think that's how everybody should think. And so again, I'll stress it one more time. This is not to just cherry pick different things and different concepts to attempt to give ourselves a good answer to this question we want to have a proper answer to this question and we want it to be a question or an answer that we can act out on a daily basis and promote on a daily basis and bring more people into that fold and i think as reptile keepers we do tend to look at the reptile hobby in a reptile industry in somewhat of a good light and i mean Obviously, we are pretty good at shining the flashlight into areas that are not good. You know, we've talked about like lots of wild imports and, and really poor care. And the, I mean, I don't need to list out the entire thing here. You guys know there's some areas of the, the hobby that are dark. But in, in general, we all start with the premise that keeping reptiles is okay. And that can make it very difficult for us to be sort of introspective on this and to look at the hobby in a way from an outsider's perspective. Because even 
if I wasn't keeping reptiles, because I'm such a deeply passionate person about wildlife and animals in general, I'm not mystified by anybody who keeps animals at home. I understand why people keep fish. I don't, I'm scared of tarantulas, but I understand why someone might have 50 tarantulas in their basement. That all clicks to me. But if you're not an animal person, if you're not sort of in touch with nature and have a respect and a reverence for the natural world, then you might really not understand why somebody might keep animals. So it is my goal to help at least start the conversation for having good answers and compelling answers for reptile keepers to answer the question, why are you keeping reptiles? And, and is that a good thing to do? And why are you, shouldn't they just be in the wild? There, there's all those things that get thrown at us. And, and we want to have good answers for that so we can start promoting this message and actually start making a positive change within society, which again, sounds like a big deal, sounds like it's impossible with just, virtu- with just through the virtue of reptile keeping. But I think there is some things that we can do to actually benefit society. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. I've mentioned this on on the podcast a couple of times, and I always picture this as a sort of a theoretical, imagine if you're a reptile keeper, which I assume you are, you're listening to this podcast. Imagine you're in a courtroom and you're sitting on the witness stand. Listeners of the podcast or longtime listeners will have heard me talk about this before. So imagine you're sitting on this witness stand and you, and the prosecuting lawyer comes up to you, the prosecuting lawyers attempting to remove our right, our quote unquote right, I prefer to use the word privilege of keeping reptiles. And they ask you, why should you be allowed to keep reptiles privately or in captive reptiles at home? You have to be able to defend yourself and defend the entire industry in in a few, in a minute or two. It's sort of like the elevator pitch for herpetoculture. And I think it's so important that we have a good refined answer for that. And it can't be, well, I really enjoy these morphs. I, I, you know, it's really neat when you can use these different uh, punnet square, yeah, punnet squares in order to make these interesting colors and whatnot. Or we have whatever. I mean, there's a bunch of reasons why I think it's not, it's not, although although they are interesting and fun parts of the hobby, they are not the most the be all and end all of why we should be allowed to keep it. Yes, there's interesting morphs, there's interesting species and whatnot, but there's more to that. There's more to herpetoculture than just that. So I guess my goal is not only to help people or at least start helping us as a community answer that question, but also just help people become a proud member of of a herpetoculture community. You know, if I'm trying to think of another community that has a sort of free pass in the general society, I don't know. It's hard to think of one because a lot of times people who (laughs) people get almost marginalized when they have a a different hobby than what's normal. Like if you're not just sitting around and watching Netflix all day, then anything you do uh, besides that is kind of weird. But even fish keepers have more respect in just general society. When I talk about general society, I'm people talking about just the people you interact with on a daily basis, people who are not keeping animals themselves. They would go to a house and go, "Wow, that's a really beautiful fish tank," and "Oh, he keeps fish. He's got a really amazing fish tank." And I think her- herpetoculture is starting to get there, but we're still kind of the weirdos. And I-, I want us to be proud of keeping reptiles. And I think the way to be proud of keeping reptiles is by knowing that you're having a very positive change and having a, a, a it's a net positive to society. So again, we're going to talk about that in a second. And I think another really important point as well is if, if we aren't able to articulate an answer to these questions, then why would we expect the greater society to do that? They, they won't be able to come up with a good answer for that question. And the issue with that is that we have to count on the greater society to have respect for the hobby because they also are in control of what we're allowed to do and not do, which is kind of a, you know, you, you might not think that, but when you are when you live inside a society, you're nested inside a community and you have you want to be able to you want to be able to exist in the community in a way that people respect you and you respect them back. And something that can happen if we, if the outsiders are starting to make the rules, and that is where government legislation comes in. And and as we know, it does, government legislation on the hobby a doesn't really work, and b is almost always misguided because we have because they have no they don't know what they're regulating. And you know, there's examples of the province that is just west of me. They, I think they've recently changed their bylaws, but up until maybe like a year ago, you could legally keep an alligator, but it was illegal to keep a Kenyan sand boa because there was no limit on the length of lizards that you could keep or crocodilians, but you couldn't keep a snake that was considered a constrictor. <laughs> so, you know, you could you could not keep a harmless two foot sand boa, but you could keep something that could rip your arm off or eat you. <laughs> so, you know, those are the, that's sort of an extreme example of 
some bylaws. And maybe I'm getting that wrong. That might be a little bit of an exaggeration of, of what you were and not were and were not allowed to keep. But it doesn't really matter because we've all come across those different scenarios where the rules don't make sense because people who are making them are not part of the hobby, so they don't understand what they're regulating. And, and this is really why I prefer to use the term privilege than right. I, I don't think it's a very potent or powerful... W- um, I don't think it's a very potent or powerful position for us to stand in to just say, if somebody says, why are you allowed to keep animals for you just to say, well, it's my right to do so, so F off. <laughs> you know, that, that that's not the best. It's a very weak and unsophisticated answer to that question. We can do so much better than that. Yeah, yeah it's the easiest straw to grab and say, you know, you can, we can hold up that rights poster all day, but it's not, it's not compelling. And we know that it's not compelling. And, and even, even when you say it, you feel weak saying it because you know that it's not a great argument. And that's why, you know, the right to keep an animal also is very closely tied to the responsibility you have keeping that animal. And we want to show people that we are extremely responsible, not only for the welfare of the animals that we keep, but the, the animals that are in the wild as well and, and their natural habitats. We're, we're responsible for the people that interact with the animals, right? We don't want to have ant- people coming to our homes and getting bitten or, or having any issues that way. We don't want to have escaped snakes get out or whatever lizards get out. We don't want an Everglades situation to happen again, right? Th- these sort of scenarios where that's where the responsibility is tightly bound to the right. So yeah, it's great that you have a right to keep an animal, but you, but you do have to make sure you're tempered in some way. And that's why I prefer privilege because the privilege to keep the animal is not granted to you by the government and when I talk about privilege I'm not talking about oh the government's granting me this privilege I I have to you know bow to them because I'm so thankful that they allow me the, the privilege to keep an animal the way I conceptualize it is it's the animal that grants you the privilege Right, so the animal that you get to keep at home has given you the privilege to do that, and that might seem sort of like metaphysical to some people. What do you mean the the animal is granting? Well, you interact with the animal on a daily basis, and you can have a relationship with that animal. You can have one that's very aggressive, and if they're mean, and and you don't have a good relationship with it, so it's a very contentious relationship all the time. Or you can have one that earned that that's based off of trust and respect. And as you build trust and respect with an animal. You can have an incredible experience working with them, and and it's a two-way street. Yes, you are the keeper, which means you're responsible for everything, and really you have the power in this in this relationship. But at the same time, they can trust you, and they can not see you as a threat, and, and that's the privilege that I'm talking about. So we owe it to the animal. Everything goes back to the animal. We owe it to the animal to improve our care. We owe it to the animal to prove to other people why it's important that we keep them. And I've said this before, ultimately the animals have given up their freedom. There, there, is a, there is a level of freedom that is no longer there because they aren't a wild animal anymore. Or you know, yes, generations of captive breeding, breeding have happened, but if, if that original animals didn't get pulled out of the wild, the animals right sitting behind me would be still in the wild. Not the exact animal, but I think you get my point. So there is a level of freedom that has been removed. And the other side of that is there is quite a lot of freedoms that are, are awarded to the animals now that they are in captivity, right? We've talked about the five freedoms before, freedom from thirst, freedom from hunger, freedom from disease, freedom from, I should have looked at it before I did this, but you know, the, the providing enrichment and stimulation, pr- uh, freedom from being uh, predated upon, right? There's, a, there's a, a, a giant list of benefits from these animals being in captivity. So there is that trade-off as well. But again, that's not a good enough answer. That, that is still somewhat of a weak answer to say, yeah, well, we put them in a box and now they don't, there's no parasites on them and, and, and whatnot, but we have to do better than just that. That is a benefit, but we can do better than that. And the last thing I'll say about you know, this quote-unquote right to keep animals is there, there is there is a hypocrisy in that, right? Because you, as I've said, you're nested inside a community and, and you can think about this on a, on a sort of a micro scale. Just think about your home life. If, if you live in a home where somebody in your home really does not want you to keep reptiles at all and you do it, now you have betrayed some trust there. And instead of having the opportunity to educate them and help and, and allow and work with them in order to hopefully get them to the point where they're comfortable having that, you've either betrayed their trust or you have betrayed their trust, which is going to create some sort of tension between the household. But also you probably rely on that person for other things, right? Not reptile related things, not animal keeping related things, but maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your parent, maybe it's your sibling. There is some give or take at some point within that household relationship. So whether they pay the bills or or go get the groceries or make food once in a while, whatever it is, 
you don't want to be betraying the trust of the people that you live in their home in your home with because that's that because you rely on them and they rely on you and that does also can be expanded onto a community point of view right if you just say well it's my right to keep so i don't care what what you do well i bet you also hope that uh the power electricians that are in charge of keeping the power running don't think, well, it's my right to not go to work today, so I'm not going to go fix that issue, and you're going to be without power, right? So, there, it, again, that's that give and take. We have to know that unless you are completely off the grid, living in a forest, running off your own windmill powered <laughs> electricity or something, you have to understand that it that to just say it's your right to do whatever you want is not valid because you do rely on other people not making that same choice or not making that same statement in order to benefit from. So we, again, two-way street. So I'm actually going to read this next sentence. So I'm going to try not to read most of this podcast because I know it can kind of be boring for just listen to somebody read. So most of it's going to be as it has been just me talking, but sometimes I'll come across a sentence that I liked and I want to read it. So as far as I can tell, reptile keepers have the opportunity to paint two different images of herpeticulture for the greater society. One, continuously demonstrate to non-reptile folks that the hobby gives people a respect for nature and wildlife, aids in conservation and preservation, allows people to participate in citizen science and add to the academic literature, and grants keepers a sense of responsibility and purpose and belonging. Or two, disregard the non-reptile keepers entirely, and allow them to draw their own conclusions for why someone feels the need to keep 30 snakes in their basement. Now, which one of those do you think is more likely to be the catalyst for government legislation? Right? I think I think that's a perfectly a perfectly said sentence to myself. <laughs> I wrote it, but but I think it gives us a perfect dichotomy between the two potential worlds. The first world is, holy, look at these incredible keepers. Look how responsible they are. Look at how they're thinking about things on a much larger scale, and they're actually aiding in conservation and preservation and, and science and, and and education. Or the mysterious guy that has a drawers, 30 drawers full of snakes in his basement that sometimes lets them get out. You know, w- Nobody understands the second scenario. You have to you have to look at this from from an outsider's perspective who has absolutely no interest in keeping reptiles or animals at all who might not even understand the difference between a snake and a lizard, right? You, you need you need to put yourself in their shoes and paint and and give them both of those options and ask them which one makes more sense. They are not going to understand the second one. They will not understand why somebody keeps 30 or 40 snakes in their basin. I promise you that. And then when you add the fact that a lot of them are kept in racks and and very small conditions and whether or not, you know, I've talked about this a lot on the podcast, the, the ethics of doing that in general, but nobody gets that. And it's so important that the greater community understands why we're doing this. I know it's tempting to just say, it's my right and I will do what I want, but you can't say that it is a weak position it is not compelling it is unsophisticated and as i already said you already hope other people within your community don't make that same assertion because you exist within a community where you benefit off of other people doing actions okay so i think again let's hold those two dich- that dichotomous world in our head this um, this picture this ideal herpeticulture and the 30 snakes in the basement we need to make sure we're shifting towards the one on the left, which is the the advancing, responsible herpeticulture. And I, I think a tough pill for reptile keepers to swallow is that we actually need to take responsibility for every ridiculous law and legislation that has come into place. Because, again, this is our hobby. We, we are the, and I know some people don't like the word hobby, but it sort of rolls off my tongue. So when we're talking about hobby, I'm talking about herpeticulture in general. This is our thing. And if we're letting people... If we don't look like a shining example of of some of a, of a positive force, then we're not going to be asked to the table to have a an opinion on something that a piece of legislation that's coming in. And this is not a defense of the government in a way. I'm not saying that the government's going to make a good choice anyway. And it's all the, the point of this podcast is also not to. This is not how to defend ourselves against legal. Uh, le- sort of legal side, the the legislation and the bylaws that come into place. That that's a part of it. But more importantly, I feel that if we are 
we have this very solid foundation and we have all these examples of things that we've done that are very positive society in general, then those pieces of legislation and bylaws are, are less likely to take hold and they're more difficult to to come into existence. And when we have the opportunity to defend ourselves, we can talk to the general public, not necessarily talk to the legislators, the people who may be influenced by animal rights groups. We know that that's a pretty common practice. Animal rights groups come to the table with a ton of money and they give the, 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 the government a list and the government just goes ahead and makes the, makes, makes the rule without talking to anybody. So I'm not saying we can kind of prevent that from happening, but we can at least talk to the other community members, people who are not necessarily in charge of the bylaws and whatnot, and, and allow them to understand our benefit. And the more we do that, the better our hobby and better herpeticulture will be, the stronger it will be, the more robust it will be to, to, to questions like, why do you keep animals at home? And I think, simply put, it's just a positive thing to do. So before I carry on, I feel like I should define a few terms because I, I tend to interchangeably use terms that I in my head have defined as the same thing. So industry, hobby, herpeticulture, trade, all of those talking about the reptile industry as a whole, the entire package, breeders, keepers, pet stores, everything, everything that, you know, exporters, all that, everything that encompasses keeping reptiles captively. That's what I'm talking about when I use those terms, obviously keepers and enthusiasts. Those are people who keep animals, breeders, people who breed animals. I think those are pretty, pretty obvious rept. Again, when I say reptile, I mean reptile amphibians or really any any creature that you might keep at home that you should ought to be justifying the reason for doing that. Industrial care is another term that I tend to use. Industrial care, people have heard me talk about this before. Um, I don't know if I, if I coined this term. I've heard people uh, attribute that term to me, but I don't think I did. But industrial care, when I talk about that, I'm talking about just the bare bones rack system. So I'm talking about an environment that produces very little enrichment for the animal, a lot of times there's no hide, just the sort of the sterile environment. Let's just put it that way. The the high production sterile environment that some argue is necessary for producing animals for the pet trade. That that might that might be true. We, we I'm not necessarily going to go down that path, but that's what I mean by industrial care. Naturalistic care or or in, enriching care is is sort of the opposite of that term, and that's where you're incorporating types of enrichment into the animal's enclosure. So whether that's an opportunity to climb, dig, swim essentially allowing the animal to act out behaviors that it would in the wild. Again, these animals, many of them evolved in very specific ecological niches, and they have the tools that they, they, they come out of the egg or they come out of their mother with the tools and the genetics in order to act out some behaviors, whether that's swimming, digging, climbing, those sort of things. We need to make sure that that's, a, that's what I mean by naturalistic care is giving the animals that opportunity to act out those natural behaviors. Again, plants, fake plants, I'm not as concerned about that, but giving them, creating an environment that allows the animal to think and be stimulated. So that's what I mean by naturalistic care. And then, of course, there's, you know, bioactive is sort of another extreme of that, which is a more holistic ecosystem with a cleanup crew and an active soil with, with bacteria and live plants and whatnot. And I don't necessarily put bioactivity as the pinnacle of husbandry. It, I think it's tied up there with, a really ultimately enriched environment, right? Sometimes because bioactive enclosures can go awry really quickly and they, they don't necessarily improve the life of the animal. And we actually did an entire podcast on that. Uh, so maybe I'll put that in the show notes as well so you guys can go listen to that. that was around one of the very first round tables we discuss it. Nothing against bioactivity. I have bioactive enclosures myself, but again, it's not the pinnacle of, of care, but it's, it's a term I will use from time to time. And I think without Anything else? Let's jump into sort of the meat and potatoes of this episode. I know that might have been a very long introduction of me just kind of rambling on, but I want to define things and make sure everybody's on the same page for what I'm talking about. And the reason I'm doing this is because I had there was a thread of comments the other day on one of my episodes, or I think it was an episode of the podcast that just talked about somebody was contending with this idea whether it was ethical to do it, and then someone else commented on it saying. I'm in the same boat. I, I really I haven't gone out and got a reptile yet because I'm still contemplating this, and I'm hoping that this provides people some guidance. This is not the answer to the. This is this is will not give you a cut and dry answer. I, I hope it stimulates conversation, and I hope that it. You know, I can only come up with a few ideas on my own, but it should spark a sort of web of ideas. You know, this is not. It's you know, just like most things in life, there's not a direct answer to things. And I'm going to give you a few of my answers, but hopefully that, again, creates a web of other answers that all support each other into this ethical question or the question of the ethics of keeping animals in captivity. Is it okay to do that? 
let's talk about it. So I think a probably an important place to start this entire conversation is just a little bit of background about myself. A, if you're new to the podcast, this is your first thing you've ever listened to, then that'll be nice. But also just in general, the podcast is typically me interviewing other people. And I, I know that there's many listeners that are dying to know more information about me. And maybe I'll shed a little bit of light on that as well. So, you know, I think what I'm talking about here up to this point is this sort of big picture mindset. You can imagine that all these concepts that I opened up within the beginning of this podcast, those are some pretty, they're not hard to grasp, but they're they are quite, I think big picture is really the only way to put it, right? If you're keeping a couple of animals at home, you, do, do you, is it necessary to be thinking this big? Is it, do you feel weird doing that because there's not, you don't feel like you have enough impact? Like there's all sorts of implications that come with trying to promote this big picture keeping. And I don't think everybody has to think this way. And I also don't think I certainly don't think people start that way. And, and I know that from my own experience. I picked up my very first reptile in 2007. That was a two-year-old crested gecko. So I was in grade 11 at the time. And that is Jackson, my crested gecko. He's sitting right over there, just off camera. He is however old he is now. I think he was born in, I, I think he hatched in 05. So he's 17, 18 years old. Still as great as he was the first day I got him. And that's what got me into the hobby initially. Now, I did not have a big picture mindset. And I did not get my second reptile until 2015. So I went a really long time, eight years in between getting my first two animals, which is kind of, you know, if you're somebody who's deeply invested in in herpeticulture, that's a pretty rare thing. But it's because I was not a herpeticulturalist for those eight years. I was a guy who kept it a crested gecko. I thought he was great. I had, you know, live plants and, you know, he's still in the same enclosure, but I've, you know, redone it a couple of times. But I, I, there was obviously no big picture thinking, but I was also not interacting with the hobby in any way. So I was just this guy keeping a gecko. And I think many people are like that. That's no issue. The point I'm trying to make is here. I don't expect someone to go out to the store, get their first animal, and then suddenly have this big picture mindset. But I think as they interact with the hobby more, as they interact with herpeticulture more, which means interacting with that means going to expos. That means going on Facebook groups is beneficial as that can sometimes not be. Uh, Going on YouTube or any of these other areas where people are interacting with each other, Instagram, We want that message to slowly seep into what they're thinking. And even if you have a single animal at home, you can still absolutely have this big picture mindset. There's nothing wrong with that. And I know tons of keepers that are like that. And it's actually pretty remarkable that that some people have one or two animals and they're able to dedicate that much time and energy and mental capacity to thinking about herpeticulture on 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 a grander sense than just simply like simply what I did my first eight years, feed my, feed my crested gecko, missed him, changes water. That's it. Now, eventually, there was sort of a cascade. There's, I think there's basically three stories here that led me to this big picture philosophy. I'm going to take you through those three different stories. and But I'll, I'll start with this initial question that I stumbled across, which was the question that I've already laid out here. But basically, is there any good reason other than selfish to keep animals in captivity? So I got to that question. And the reason that question popped into my head was an experience that I had in about 2016. So whatever that is, six years ago now. And I basically... In, in 2015, I bought my second animal. That was my day gecko. And again, same sort of thing. I didn't really interact with the hobby too much at the beginning. I got this gecko. I set it up naturalistically, live plants and whatnot. But that was my gateway into herpeticulture, the second animal I got. The, the, her, the, the day gecko introduced me to this broader world, Facebook groups, YouTube. And then I started to get pulled in. So then once you start getting pulled in, then you start wanting more animals. And, and in 2016... Well, later in 2015, after I got my day gecko, a couple months later is when I got my first boa. So for those watching, I think you can maybe see my boa. If, I'm not sure if you can see that. But anyway, he's up in his trees behind me. That's Winston. And so I got him in 2015, shortly after my day gecko. But that's when I was already snowballing into the deeper sense of herpeticulture and and, 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 and communicating with that community on, on a daily basis, basically, just like many of us do now. So then, now that I was in this world on a little bit more of a, of a consistent basis, I started looking at the local classifieds, just like many of us do in Canada, it's Kijiji, in the States, it's Craigslist or whatever else there is. And you, you start looking at it. And so I started, you start doing this on a daily basis, just seeing if there's any animals for sale, things that you might want. And actually, maybe before I, I tell that story, I, I, I will say one other thing too, but you know, I had these geckos. As I said, I had them in these naturalistic setups with plants and whatnot. And and even though at the, the two geckos, I was not in the hobby. Like I said, I was still 
external from herpeticulture, but it was still such a natural instinct for me to keep them in a way that they would be, exist in the wild. That's why I would look at pictures of Madagascar, look at pictures of New Caledonia. I'm trying to establish these enclosures in a way that that's natural. And that was all, that was instinctual to me. That was something that I did on in, intuition. But as soon as I got my first snake, this is part of that combination of, of being involved in herpeticulture on a, on a more consistent basis, is I started seeing how people kept snakes. And I quickly fell into that trap of thinking, wow, these are so easy. You could just keep them in a tub, very pl plain setups, easy to set up. And I started to kind of snowball down that route a little bit, even though it seemed very unnatural and foreign to do that to my geckos and I, you know, even frogs. I never kept frogs myself, but you know, you would see frogs as well, dart frogs and whatnot. They were never kept that way. But snakes, I started going down that path. I think, okay, this is easy. And I actually, then, then I got my second boa later in, in early 2016. And this was a Kijiji sort of quote unquote rescue, an animal that was in real rough condition. I bought her as a hatchling or it was a, not a hatchling, maybe about a year old. And, uh, or I shouldn't say hatchling, I should say uh, a neonate, but she wasn't a neonate. For those that don't know, boas give live birth. But anyway, it, it was about a year after this boa had been born and I, and stuck shed the whole nine yards, really horrible condition. So I pulled her in as well. And so I was kind of keeping this like pretty sterile way you know not not the very basic industrialized paper towel water dish situation but it was a tub I didn't have a ton of enrichment and somehow in my head I actually separated the geckos and the snakes this way which I which is now looking back is kind of strange but I think that was just the pull of, of that world it was very appealing to know that you can keep them very simply because you can have more and more and more and I, I even started contemplating breeding boas and, and this will lead us into our very first story about how I started thinking about the hobby on a more of a more of a deep level. But I had these two boas that are both het for different things, and I thought, wow, if I if you know if I keep breeding them and do all these different things, I can create this morph. And I, I sat in that space for like a couple of weeks, at least, maybe even a month, where I, or two months, where I was thinking, maybe I'm just gonna raise them up. I want to get into boa breeding and morph breeding, and, and that was really cool. But this experience happened. So this is the first story. So I found on Kijiji, which is our local classifieds, I found a litter of boas and it was there. And I think it was actually the original litter of boas that the second boa came from. And it essentially had been on Kijiji for 12 months straight. There was a year of the same litter on Kijiji, constantly refreshing the ads. And then I realized, wait a minute, you know, if, if why, how could I possibly breed boas? You know, you're going to get somewhere between, I don't know, 20 and 30 animals or whatever it is, or probably an average of 20. It's been a while since I've looked into boa breeding. I, I cannot inject that many animals into the community I live in because there, there's a clear issue here. Not only did I have to rescue one of the animals that's currently on Kijiji, but the, her siblings are still for sale. And the price just kept dropping. It was down to like $60. This person's just trying to get rid of them because they bred the boas because probably they were interested and wanted to breed them. Fair enough. But maybe didn't look at the market size and didn't realize that, hey, this market can't hold this many boas. So if, if it couldn't hold a single boa litter, there was no way I could add to it. And that's what started making me snowball. Okay, you know, you got to start looking at this on a deeper level, or at least slow down to the point where you're not just adding animals into existence without, you know, having a, a place for them to go. And so on top of that, so not only was I seeing that same litter of boas, but as I became more involved in herpeticulture, like I said, you're scanning through these classifieds all the time, you start seeing the conditions of some of these animals that are being resold. You go, okay, there's a dehydrated bearded dragon, there's an emaciated ball python, there's this, there's that, there's a there's a chameleon with probably a respiratory infection this person had for a year and they don't want anymore. It just continued to go. And then you then you start go, okay, we have a problem here. There there's actually a, a, a poor level of care. And so in, in 2016, again, this is before the podcast, two years before animals or a year before animals at home even existed. I went on to the forum snakes. Maybe some of you are familiar with that. It's, it's what is it? S S snakes with two S's on, on sort of book ending the word. I think that's just a forum. And I posted the following post. The topic of discussion is the amount of herps that we see in terrible conditions due to poor husbandry. This is and by the way, this is funny to read now because this is like the premise of, this is sort of the foundation of my podcast, but you can see this is where my brain was thinking two years before I even started the podcast. Anyway, I'll start from the top. The topic, the topic of discussion is the amount of herbs we see that are kept in terrible conditions due to poor husbandry. This is a problem that arcs across the entire industry. I would be willing to bet that the percentage of herbs in poor care is higher than most other pet industries, such as cats and dogs. Now, 
again, reading not, not reading on the post just, just for this next sentence. I don't know if that's true, but this is what I had said at the time. So then I, I continue. There are people in the world like us who are incredibly passionate about reptiles. These people are not looking for a pet as much as we are looking for a complex project that brings along the beauty of the natural world within, within it. I think we all get enjoyment out of replicating our, our animal's natural environment through perfect husbandry and enjoy the challenge of doing so. Then there are people who just want pets. They're not interested in cracking a book to see the natural history of their animal or even basic care sometimes. They just want a new animal and that's it. They will feed it, water it, and feel like they've done their job because they are not looking for a very complex project like we tackle every day. Now, again, I'm going to pull myself out of that post for a second. It's funny because I was making this on a, on a snake forum, which a lot of people were keeping in these industrial style care racks. Now, I, now looking back, I wonder if they if they interpreted that as me attacking them or if they interpreted it as thinking that their rack systems were a naturalistic type of care or you know something based off natural history. Both are po- possible. And again, at this time, I was still kind of keeping my boas in fairly, I shouldn't say plain setups. I think probably at this time they were still in tubs, but tall tubs with branches and no lighting, but substrate. I, I, I did pull myself out of that. As soon as I saw that boa, you couldn't breed them and it didn't make sense for me to add litters to the market. I started you know, increasing the enrichment within their tubs, but I still wasn't doing a great job here at, at this point anyway. Anyway, back to the post. I said, reptiles have two characteristics that make them subject to high percentage of poor care. The first is that they have generally more complicated husbandry than your average pet. Talking about cats and dogs here, reptiles are a little bit more in depth. And two, they also have quite a long uh, lifespan, even when kept in poor conditions. Just look at the local classifieds in your area. I'm sure they're similar to mine. Full of animals two to five years old with lifespans over 20 plus years that are no longer wanted. It happens all the time. Is this a problem that can be fixed? Or will it always plague the reptile community? In my opinion, breeders need to be more responsible for the animals they sell by making sure they're headed to good home. I think most breeders actually do this all the time. But some definitely don't. The ones that are producing thousands of animals a year obviously don't have time to do that, as I say here. And the local pet stores quite often don't either. Please share your thoughts. So anyway, that's the end of that post. And I, I, there's some stuff that I obviously still very much agree with. There's some stuff that I think maybe I could have, you know, it was a little bit naive on my part as far as, I don't know. We'll talk about that more later. But that anyway, that, that was my mindset at the time. I was seeing this issue, this plague of what I would call the plague of the reptile hobby or uh, herpeticulture was a lot of animals that are going for resale, which means we're not doing a good enough job educating the customer or we're overproducing. It's sort of one of those two things. And the second thing that happened to me during the same time is I came across this quote. And I don't know who said the quote, and I hate that I don't know because I I reference it all the time. So if you know who said this, please let me know. And at this point, I've definitely paraphrased it because I can't find the original quote. But anyway, the original quote was, or my paraphrase of what I thought was the original quote, the better the care, the more your animal will reward you with its fascinating natural behaviors. So when I saw that, that was kind of like a smack in the face for me. So at the time, I was still kind of toying with you know simplistic tubs, but I was still seeing this issue of the classifieds. But then I also saw this quote, and I thought, oh, wow, that quote summarizes keeping animals perfectly. And I and, and it just I understood what the quote mean instantly. And the way I interpret that quote is, animals can be very boring to keep if you keep them in boring environments. And there's there's nothing interesting about keeping an animal in a small tub that's dark where you can't see it and you're not allowing it to act out its behavior. You almost want to think of it as like a zoo. If you bring people over to your house and the animals, you have to pull them out and you see them coil up in the back, that's not that exciting. You want them to be watch. You want the animals to be acting out naturally. And an- another little mental exercise I go through when I talk about this is if you had the choice of seeing a photograph of an animal or seeing a documentary of an animal, what would you choose? And most people would say the documentary because they want to see more in depth. They want to see the animal move. They want to see what what behaviors they exhibit. And then then the question on top of that is, is what would you rather do? Would you rather see an animal in a documentary or would you rather see the animal live in the zoo or in the wild, right? And most people would rather see it wild or in, in, or in the zoo because they want to see in person it acting out its behaviors. So I think innately most people want to see that. They want to see the animal do what it does best. And 
That's what that quote summarizes perfectly. If you give them the opportunities, they will continue to reward you with their amazing, fascinating natural behavior, whether it's burrowing, climbing, swimming, whether it's harvesting berries off a berry bush, if you have a, 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 an animal that eats fruit. There's just an unlimited amount of behaviors that we would all be fascinating seeing on like a Planet Earth documentary. And you can replicate that in your own home if you provide them the right things. And so, those sort of two things in general started making me go down this path. Now, there's two more stories that go along with me getting into this more de- in-depth mindset. So th- that is the first one. Oh, and sorry. Before I move on, I just saw another note that I had made. I, I think it's really important to to separate the difference between abhorrent care, horrible care that's causing the animal serious distress, and then industrialized care. If you are keeping in an industrialized way, if you're breeding in these sort of plain racks with very low st- mental stimulation, that animal is still living in a way that's not actively killing it. Now, I guess you could make that argument. We, we could do that all day, and I do all the time on the podcast, but I do want to very much distinguish. I don't think people who are keeping in racks is the same person who's keeping in a basically a tiny... A- I almost swore. <laughs> I won't swear. I'll try to keep this clean. A tiny little enclosure or a tiny little fish tank. For example, the, the boa that I quote-unquote rescued, that animal was in an exoterra, uh, a 24 foot, or it's 24 foot, 24 inch high, 18 by 18, and which is maybe you could have made it work with a small neonate boa, but it had no climbing opportunity, so it was just on the on the on the f- floor. I think there was a hide, there was a red lamp, and it was just hot in there. A red lamp on full, probably a 50 50 watt red classic reptile bulb, hot, dry, tons of shed, uh, shed skin all over the place and also stuck to the animal itself. She was feeding, I forget what she was doing with the, with the feeding schedule, but there was something bizarre happening with it. She was feeding it like every day. It was very weird. And that's actually a tame example for what some of these things, uh, you know, some animals are living in conditions, condition wise. So I want to, I do want to distinguish the difference between, I don't think that an industrialized care is the same as something that's just downright despicable and actually causing the animal metabolic bone disease. And and again, I, I should be careful the way I say that too, because I don't want, if you had an animal that developed metabolic bone disease and you, you probably feel bad about it and you wish you wouldn't have, and, and you know, you're probably next time you care for an animal, you're going to make sure you understand the supplement regime and whatnot. But there are tons of people who are on that far side who have no clue that they're damaging the animal. And again, so those are that's a distingu- dis- uh, distinguishing factor between the two. And what I want to note within this first story is that it, it's basically the difference between people who want to engage in this bigger picture mindset and then those who don't. And those who don't can be decent keepers like me with my first crest gecko, or they can be keepers who are just not keeping properly. There's a miseducation. Maybe they shouldn't have bought that animal in the first place. And so, so that is an issue that we want to start working towards. So again, though all these things are kind of popping up in my early reptile keeping career and making me think, okay, we, we got to, we, again, slow down. Should we be doing this? And if we should be doing it, then why? So let's move on to the second story. So the second story has to do with the ethical conundrum of offering naturalistic care for your animals. Now this sounds, how is that, how could that be an ethical conundrum? If you're providing naturalistic care for your animal, that must mean you're improving their care, you're working towards something better. But I'll just tell you my experience. When I, when I started trying to work towards this, as I was moving my way out of these tubs with my boas and trying to create better environments, starting to look up, you know, going into what the rainforest looks like and whatnot and, and make a better habitat for them you get to a point where you continue to creep towards creep and creep and creep and creep towards their natural environment and then you hit a point where you go wouldn't it just be better if this snake was in the amazon rainforest i'm spending all this time all this money pushing this box to be more and more like the amazon rainforest substrates climbing branches humidity rain cycles plants and then you go well wouldn't it just make sense if this animal, instead of being on the floor of an enclosure, was on the floor of the rainforest? And that's actually a really good question because because it, it, it does put you, it, it, it sort of makes you think full circle. And you get to a point where, again, you start asking yourself, is this the ethical thing to do? Is it actually ethical to try to replicate the natural, the, the natural factors of the Amazon rainforest? Or would it be more ethical to just to have that animal out in the wild? Because again, the, the, probably the most natural experience for a boa would be in the wild. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to go release my animals into the wild. And it, and it, and it also encounters, it takes into account what I had mentioned at the beginning of this episode, the, the concept that being in the wild is not 
ultimate freedom, right? You have parasites, you have uh, predation, you have all sorts of you know, hardships, starvation, different things like that that happen in the wild that don't happen in captivity. But I don't even know if that's enough. At the time, I certainly didn't know if that was enough to justify revoking their freedom to such an extent from the wild, right? You you really do, you know, many animals are no longer to, uh, allowed to go through their natural mating and breeding cycles and certainly don't get to move as much as they would in the wild. So there's certain things that happen in captivity that you have to justify. And that's where I found myself stuck. I'm trying to replicate nature. Does it make sense for me to do this or would it make sense for them to just be in nature? So again, that's another story that led me to start thinking about these things on a deeper level. So again, this is starting to build this guiding philosophy. I I needed to stand more I needed to stand on a foundation of more than just good quality care because yes, that was great for the animals that I keep, but it doesn't justify keeping in captivity as a whole. So my next step, which leads us to the third story, was that was the conservation piece. It's like, okay, if I can take my animals and at least somehow support conservation in some way, then I'm starting to build a good justification for doing what I'm doing. So what I did is I went and found a conservation that's based out of Canada because for those who don't know, I'm in Canada. And I was specifically looking for a conservation that focused on conserving land and preserving land in the areas that are roughly where some of my animals were native from. So I, at, at the time, I was mostly just thinking about my snakes, my boas. I had, I had two boas and a rainbow boa at this point. And so I was thinking, okay, the Amazon rainforest would be, you know, we, we know there, how much damage is happening there and how an amazing, beautiful, biodiverse area of the world it is and, and how important it is to make sure that that doesn't go away. So I went and found a charity and I found the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy, which is a charity out of Toronto or out of Ontario, Canada. And I was super excited because this is perfect. Now, at this time, my YouTube channel was just starting up. I was starting to do sort of DIY projects and whatnot. And I was starting this blog and called Animals at Home. That's where the name originally came from. And so I thought, okay, I'll take some of my ad revenue, which is minuscule at that point from Google which is the, the ad revenue to get from YouTube as well as the, the ads that are on the site, as well as I would sell t-shirts, $5 for every t-shirt would go to the Amazon rainforest. So I, I reached out to the directors or the, the board and just said, hey, this is my, my name is Dylan. I run this channel called Animals at Home. It's mainly about reptile keeping and keeping in captivity. And I really want to support what you guys do because I think it's super important. And they came back to me and basically said, thanks for the email, but no thanks. <laughs> And so you have to imagine how poignant of an experience that is because you have a charity who's turning down money, which is super interesting, right? You now, and now really what they were turning down was they, they didn't want the public affiliation. They didn't want me to affiliate with them, and what, which is pretty surprising, right? And the reason was, the same reason that you probably already know, is because they are outsiders from the herpeticulture and they see the bad parts about the hobby. They see the Kijiji list or the, the Craigslist uh, issue. They see the overproduction. They see the mass issues with, with uh, care and conditions, all those things that I started pointing out in the first story. And that's their impression of, of the reptile hobby. So I emailed them back and I basically said, I understand. I can see where you guys are coming from. I said, the connection publicly is not important to me. What is, what is important to me is I still will make donations. I'm still going to do what I did. And I'm going to submit them. I just won't say your name on the podcast. At this time, there was no podcast. But I said I, I would I'd still make donations. I just wouldn't say your name on the, or, or have links or anything to the YouTube channel or to, to your website from the YouTube channel and whatnot or the blog. And, but I also went, went further. And maybe I'll read my response to that as well. So first off, I made the point of saying that I do not take any offense to the fact that they denied my my donations or my public donations. So that, that, that again, totally understand, understandable from my point of view. So I went on to say, I would love to explain from my point of view where wildlife foundations and the pet trade intersect. I said, this is not at all a way to help to sort of sway the ARC board, ARC being Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. I wasn't trying to go into their board meetings and say, this is why you should let me publicly donate. I was just saying, I'm going to donate, but here's some, some things, uh, sort of food for thought. The pet trade will always exist. Thankfully, the lion's share of the exotic pet trade in North America is supported through captive raised and bred animals. Of course, I realized at some point the past ancestors of these animals in the pet trade were pulled from their native environments to initially support the trade. I cannot argue in support of that, although now that it has occurred, I am able to see some benefits in it. I, like many people, are completely fascinated by animals, especially reptiles. Years ago, I decided that I would keep my own. By keeping my own reptiles, 
I have become even more fascinated with them, and therefore I'm even more sympathetic to this current situation of their native counterparts. As far as I can tell, the pet trade is not going away. The animals within the pet trade are very much a distinct population from their distant wild relatives. Part of the reason I started my blog was to promote the natural care of captive reptiles, and I figured because I figure we owe them, that's the least we owe them. The pet populations in North America are not threatening the native populations. I argue that they are beneficial to them. The pet trade does the following. A. Sparks interest and allows, allows for interactions with exotic animals. B. Requires animal owners to learn about their natural habitats. I said my goal with Animals at Home blog is to convert the enthusiasm, the enthusiasm pet owners have for their animals into monetary donations directed towards their animals' natural habitat. I agree with the presupposition that most of your board members have, which is wild animals should be left in the wild. However, what if we use the population that already is here to stay and educate people on the crisis of the rainforest? The people who are supporting my website will not be physically donating. Instead, they will be dona donating by proxy by learning information about their animals through my site and by way of Google AdWords, that's the ad revenue I was talking about, and Amazon affiliate commissions, I will be making don donations. People who own snakes love snakes. And are they currently donating to your charity? And if not, why not? I know it doesn't precisely fit within the mission of ARC, but I can tell you with certainty, with certainty that pet lovers are eager to help native counterparts. I can't speak for the current poaching that's taking place, but if I had to wager the animals, yeah, I should probably mention before I read this paragraph, I believe she, and I'd have to go back to my emails, but the, the context between the, for this next paragraph is I believe that there was actually, you know, poachers happening on the, on the land in Peru. So they, they, they own these large swaths of land in Peru that they're helping preserve. And I think they were having issues with, with smugglers coming in and pulling animals from there and bringing them into the pet trade. No surprise to anybody listening to this podcast. So I said, I can't speak for the current poaching that's taking place, but if I had to wager the animals in Lima are not being shipped to North America due to CITES and other animal import laws. Now, Again, there's some naivety with this so far with this with this letter that I'm reading. I now know that there is still a lot of illegal things that happen and our goal is to make that stop and I think lots of, is in place to prevent that from happening, but I am not naive enough to think that that doesn't happen anymore. And I you know also further up I had mentioned that wild animal most of the pet trade is captive bred, which is true, but there is still some wild animals coming in. Again, I've talked about that in the past, not necessarily a bad thing if they're ending up in the right hands. If they're ending up in the hands of people who are going to captively breed and create a, 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 a captive bred colony of that species, I'm okay with that. If it's ending up in PetSmart to sell to a 10-year-old kid who's getting their first Chinese water dragon, not, I do not believe that's a good idea. So anyway, that's just my little um, tangent for this paragraph. I said, we as pet traders in North America, and especially people who are attracted to my blog, do not view picking from the rainforest or do not view the rainforest as a picking ground for new pets which is so true. Anybody here listening to this podcast is believes in captive bred, high quality animals, unless you happen to be one of those higher level breeders and keepers that is looking for wild blood to help start breeding projects to help protect some animals that are already endangered in the wild. Those two things exist at the same time and they're both equally as ethical in my opinion. So again, for the most part, we're not going into the rainforest and Actually, I stand by this sentence. We do not believe the rainforest as a picking ground for new pets. That is true across the board. If you're somebody who's using wild-caught animals to establish new captive-bred colonies, you don't consider those pets necessarily because you're working with that species trying to establish a good colony. It's not your pet. So again, I think that that sentence actually works for everybody. And I continue. In the contrary to that, many of us feel that preserving the animals in captivity with clean bloodlines will go a long way to preserving the animals on the planet. In the end, I'm looking to attract people to my site who are individuals with the same goal as your foundation. Now that I read this, I'm not sure my YouTube channel even existed at this point. It may have just been my blog. Anyway, without the pet trade, I certainly would not know the unbelievable explosive color of a, rainbow, a Brazilian rainbow boa or the insane muscular strength of a boa imperator. And I can guarantee you that I would not be interested in do donating to, the charity, to a charity if it weren't for them. Having said all of that, I'm still definitely interested in supporting ARC in some way, shape, or form with my blog. I think I will let my audience know that I'm supporting a South American Rainforest Conservation Foundation or something along those lines without mentioning the specific name of your charity. So that is the end of that letter. So again, 
my point to them was we have a massive group of people who absolutely love snakes, who are interested in protecting them, whether that's in captivity or in the wild, and that we should be harnessing those keepers and those people to help fund conservation. That's a whole untapped market that they don't even think about because the pet trade, the exotic pet trade, puts a bad taste in many people's mouth, especially if you're if you're dealing with a, a piece of land in the rainforest and you have people actively poaching off that land. It's hard to it's hard to argue why the pet trade is important. So again, going back to the original concept through the introduction of this episode, we are trying to make it so outsiders have a clear understanding of what we're doing with this with this trade, with this industry. And and I, I think most people are probably well aware at this point, if you're a, a listener of the podcast, that I do now have a publicly open relationship with Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. And I did basically immediately after sending that letter. Like I said, I don't think, the, I know the podcast didn't exist then, but I think, I don't think even the YouTube channel did, or maybe it did, I, I forget, it doesn't matter. As soon as I sent that letter, Jana Bell, the founder of the charity, emailed me back and just said, look, I, we totally understand your perspective now. We were totally, we didn't think of it that way. And we we're also unaware of the fact that there are people in the pet trade who are, who are passionate and who are interested in conservation and interest, interested in ethical keeping and so on and so on and so on. So from that point on, we said, yeah, we're going to have this public relationship. And we've, I think at this point we've donated, I want to say over, was it, around $1,500 to that charity, either through t-shirts and sweater sales, like $5 for every shirt does go to to that charity and that's at animalsathome.ca slash shop or through the ad revenue that I've received from YouTube or Amazon. I donate a percentage of that every, usually I make quarterly donations. I let it build up for a couple of months and then I'll make a $100 or $200 donation, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on how much ad revenue there was or t-shirt sales there were and that's been accumulating over time. So again, those are the three stories that led me to think about this in a more of a deeper big picture mindset the first was seeing there was bad care happening there is animals an overproduction of likely an overproduction of animals or certainly a, a lack of education the second story talked about this naturalistic concept you know pushing towards natural keeping and then you run into the wall of is it even natural to keep them in captivity can you it, can you keep an animal in captivity in a natural way or does it make more sense to just have them in captivity or in, in the wild, I should say? And then the third is confronting a charity and realizing that they actually, they, they know so little about us and they have such a bad taste in their mouth from the exotic pet trade that they don't even want to accept donations from someone in the pet trade. So those three stories said made me think, okay, we need to start doing something here. This this is a a, a, a very important topic to discuss and it's important that we start laying out a foundational guiding philosophy for all keepers to operate off of so we can have better and more positive interactions with the public. And maybe a better way of phrasing that is it became very obvious to me that reptile keepers were very scattered. There wasn't a specific direction that many people were, that that the majority of the hobby was headed. And I don't expect this podcast to change that. I don't expect the entire hobby to be on the same train with moving in the same direction. That's not, that wouldn't make for an exciting hobby. We want to have a variation of ideas and methodologies, etc. But But I do think we are in some ways just driving all over the place and doing things because we can without really thinking about the greater implications. And at least that was my experience in looking at the majority of reptile keepers. So the, the question is, how, where do we point our ship and how do we point our ship? How do we prove that we deserve to keep the reptiles at home? How do we prove it to ourselves? How do we prove it to our animals, our community? The way we do that is by taking the ultimate responsibility over everything within the industry. That entire basket of breeders, keepers, pet stores, imports, whatever, everything, we need to take responsibility for it all and have all of that working together into the at least some semblance of some direction. And I think that guiding philosophy can be summarized in something like this, and again, I don't have the answers. It's just me thinking on the go here, but and slash reading things that I've written over the past few years. But I think the, the guiding philosophy needs to be something like, we must do what is best for the animal, which includes both captive animals and the wild animals. I think that's actually a pretty simple sentence, but really does cover a ton of, of ground, right? If you're doing what's best for the animals in captivity, that means you're helping produce or have better welfare for the animal that's living in your home and then also how do you how do you attach that to the wild counterparts and we'll talk about that a little bit i think 
being respectful for the spark of life that is your reptile is paramount. They are in your care, so they really do deserve the best you can offer. And again, it doesn't mean you're starting with this excellent, amazing care. It means you're, you are at least starting with the mindset that progress and, and well, progress, progre- progressing your ability to care for the animals. You're, you're sitting with an open-minded framework. In other words, you get the animal, you're not going to have perfect care at the beginning, but can you continue to build on that for the next 10, 15, 20 years? Keeping reptiles is not about you. It's about you and your animal and the community you exist in, and the natural habitat that animal comes from. It, everything is encompassed in reptile keeping. Again, that is a big picture mindset that many people might be resistant to, but I think it's the key to making sure that we are doing, we are a positive, a net positive, and a force for good. So again, if we're going to sort of define this philosophy as doing what's best for the animal, both wild and captive, then there's a few different ways we can go about this. The first is your actions as a keeper. And that's not actions as a keeper is going out and raising awareness. I'm talking about your actions as how you interact with your animals in your reptile room or the animal that you keep. Whether you keep one, whether you keep 100, whether you keep 200, there are things that you can implement on a daily basis that can at least cover your ground or cover the basis of are you doing what's ethical for the animal in captivity? We'll talk about, in a little bit, we'll talk about the animals in a while, but we'll start with the animals that are in your care. So the first thing is know your animal. Understand your animal. The natural history, the natural environment that they're coming from, their common behaviors, their, their status, if you're working with an animal that is endangered or threatened. Most of us probably who are pet keepers are not dealing with animals that are threatened or or, or endangered but that's also good to know because you never know sometimes weird things come through wild shipments or wild caught shipments end up in pet stores and who knows what they are again we'll talk about wild caught in a second but those those are very important natural history natural environment and knowing their behaviors so understand that so you can set the environment up for the animal in a way that allows it to exist is as naturally as possible again going back to that quote the better your care the more your animal will reward you with its fascinating natural behaviors that is a true statement and it is also a positive feedback loop because the more you do that the more you see and the more interesting keeping is now if i look over my left shoulder i see my boa climbing in the branches relaxing basking that is the behavior that i would expect to see in the wild and I absolutely love that I can come down into my reptile room and see that here and see him acting naturally. I don't see him pacing back and forth, rubbing his nose up against the glass. He's actually doing what he would do in the wild. That is a massive reward as a keeper. So that is one thing that you can do. Or those, That concept of understanding your animal is really, really key. Now, the second thing that you can do as a keeper is progress your care. And I mentioned that a little bit earlier, making sure that you are dedicating yourself to moving forward with your care. Now, there's there's always speed bumps that come. There, there's there's um, amount of space you have, money that you have, you know, access to information. There's there's so many different reasons why you might get stagnant in your care, and we all get stagnant for some periods of time where you just don't make any developments. But you at least want to have that goal of progressing and getting better. So whether it's adding new lighting or adding new branches or doing more research on their natural weather cycles for the habitat that that animal comes from, there's always something you can do better and you want to have that mindset. I think one of the worst things that's happened in herpeticulture is that there's these deep grooves that run through it of of ways of doing things. And people just say, this is the way you do it. And we've been doing it for 30 years. Here's the success we've had with it. So there's no need to change it. And that that philosophy is weak. And the reason it's weak is because we're dealing with biology. We're dealing with science. There's no answer. There's no correct answer. There's just more information. And it is so vital that that's how you treat keeping animals. You can't treat it as a cookie cutter. Here's how you set up the tub and that's how it will live. Yes, the animal will live. It's not going to thrive. It's going to exist for 15 years. Maybe it'll have a half half of its lifespan will be cut short because it's completely immobile, not moving, you know, again, I'm trying to avoid going down these paths for this episode of the podcast. But the point is, is there is no black and white answer because it's science, it's biology. There's always something that we can do better. There's always more to learn. These animals are far more intelligent than we think. They're far more, they have a far more diverse range of behaviors than many of us think. They are great at problem solving. They deal with incredible things in the wild. And again, it's our duty to make sure we're providing that. So progression of care 
is so key. I don't care if you're 12 years old and you're listening to this and you're starting with a fish tank and a hide. There are things that you can do over the next couple of years to make that animal's life better. And the great thing about reptiles is they're incredibly patient. They're incredibly durable. You're not going to be able to do everything tomorrow, but we can slowly add to this care and this husbandry to create a better welfare for the animal that you keep. And the other thing to think about too, and I've talked about this as well, is that that hedonic cycle, the hedonic treadmill that we can sometimes get on where the excitement in your hobby comes from purchasing a new animal and then that excitement fades. And then you got to bump up that dopamine cycle one more time to buy another animal. And then you get stuck in this concept of only enjoying the hobby, only enjoying reptile keeping when you actually purchase a new animal. And that is not a good place to be because A, you're going to be overwhelmed. You're if, if you own 40 snakes and they all live 30 years, potentially 30 years, then it's hard to extrapolate that as a, as a 25-year-old person. You can't even really think about your life, what your life is going to be like when you're 60 but theoretically, you should have 30 snakes when you're 55 or, or, you know, close to that. I'm sort of exaggerating with some of these lifespans, but not really. You know, most, a lot of snake species are going to live somewhere between 20 and 40 years, if not more. And it can be very difficult to picture our lives that far down the road. So getting stuck in that hedonic cycle of constantly buying new animals is a very dangerous place to be. So you need to redirect that excitement and redirect that energy into progression of care. The pro progression of care is such a magical tool in herpeticulture because you can completely redo an enclosure, buy a new enclosure, do something and change the environment, do better by creating more of a natural environment. And it will, you will get that dopaminergic response, that excitement that, that, that you get when you buy a new animal because there's something new that's happened. You can, you can walk in and see your animal behaving in a different way. And that, that is just so key that you're, you are slowly expanding. You're not just relying on the excitement of a new animal to, to fund your or to fuel your passion for reptile keeping because that always ends poorly many times you see it all the time people hit a point where they've got way too many animals and they never got in front of the fact that they were just buying new animals to hit that dopamine cycle and then they then they have to get rid of them because they can't afford them and you know who who would have predicted covid nobody but many people are now are hurting financially energy crisis and whatnot and there are people that are in a bad position because they have too many animals. So be slow with your collection. And and as I'm saying this, I want to just say uh, that there's an um, the project Herpeticulture is a, is a podcast that's also on the on the Animals at Home podcast network. And they just did an amazing episode with Billy Sven. I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, Billy. And they he he has this incredible list of ten tenants that he uses to guide his reptile care, which is very similar to the philosophy I'm talking about here. And he he goes into real good uh, great depth for each of those tenants and again that's what i'm saying this podcast that i'm recording here is not the answer there are other people and hopefully it sparks other ideas that are within the same sort of vein of of doing um, trying to be better keepers and one of them one of his tenants is my collection will expand slowly and i think that's exactly what i'm getting to here that that hedonic cycle is such a scary and dangerous place to be don't allow new purchases to fuel your passion for reptiles. I think it's simply put like that. And the other thing too is breeding can become very addicting as well because it's a sort of a more advanced version of herpeticulture. There's another step. It's If, if you kind of get stagnant with your care because you're doing a really good job caring for your animals, a lot of times the next obvious step is breeding. And as rewarding and as incredible as that can be, it can also be a risk. Going back to that first story that I shared, that litter that sat on Kijiji for 12 months, if you are going to step into the breeding world, make sure that you are adding animals to a market that can handle it. I think I'm just going to leave it at there. I don't want to get into that concept too much because I'm really trying to talk about progressing of care. So if you get to the point where you think, I want to try breeding, maybe first tinker with progressing your care and also simultaneously check with the market to make sure whatever you're producing can can handle it. We we get the most pleasure in herpeticulture when you're pushing your skills, and we all know that when you're working on an enclosure, or working on a new project, you get your teeth sunk into something. That is where the most amount of pleasure comes from, and that's why breeding is such a good answer to to many people because you're pushing your skills into a new domain, and you've not done, you've not uh, paired snakes before, you've not handled eggs before, so on and so on and so on, and that's scary and exciting at the same time, and that's why it's very fulfilling. But there are a lot of animals on the market. 
right? There's a huge amount of animals that are going into rescues and whatnot. So I'm not saying don't breed. I'm just saying be very careful what you breed. And we probably don't need many more ball pythons. Let's put it that way, because that is a ever present revolving door of animals that end up in rescues. And I've recorded a couple podcasts most recently with Grace Danks. And I'll put that in. That was episode number 143 worth listening to as well. So anyway, progression of care. That's another thing that you can do. So know your animal, progress your care. And there's two more things that I think as keepers we can we can do to make sure at least your house is in order. And the first is cap, making sure you're purchasing captive bred animals. There, there is a large amount of wild-caught animals that still come in the market that are unnecessarily coming in. So as a keeper, you especially if you're just buying a pet and you're not working on some sort of you know more complex breeding project, you don't need to be buying wild-caught animals. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is conservation. So this can be very irritating to people who actively participate in conservation because a lot of times reptile keepers think they're conservationists by simply keeping reptiles. And I, I've talked about this before that it's kind of like a bumper sticker. We just say like, yep, keep reptiles. So that means me and I'm participating in conservation. Well, you're not participating in conservation because conservation is conserving something that already exists. So if you're working with captive bred animals, you're not conserving anything. You might be preser- preserving a, a, a species of animal or a, a genre of, of animals if you're working with a specific breeding project, for example. Maybe you're preserving those by if their natural habitat is being destructed and you have a, a captively bred colony that's protected from that, that's preservation, but that's not conservation. Conservation is making sure that, that those animals don't leave their natural habitat and making sure that that natural habitat doesn't get destroyed by whatever, you know, the, if it, human activity is destroying their, the rainforest. So how do you participate in conservation? Well, it's pretty easy. The first thing is find a, cha- find a conservation to donate to. You, you could donate 30 bucks a year, 10 bucks a year, uh, 10 bucks a month, whatever is comfortable for you. I mean, how many of us, especially in the West, we spend a lot of money on stuff that we don't need. Going to Starbucks costs $6 now. You know, <laughs> getting an Americano is like, I think it's like almost $6, which is just crazy. So if you could, if you do that once a week, and you could spend, easily replace that by giving $20 to a conservation. And an exciting way to do that is find the animals that you keep, you could probably find a conservation organization that works in the area that those animals exist in natively or naturally. So just go go find it. If you depend, it doesn't matter what you what you keep. Find a conservation that speaks to you, whether it's an whether it's linked to an animal you keep or not, or it's just an area of the world that you hope that doesn't disappear anytime soon. Participate in that in that donation in some capacity. It doesn't have to be a lot, but really they do they do require money. There's just no way around it, and. If you're just listening to this podcast, then you are probably helping support conservation, especially if you're listening on YouTube because then some of the ad revenue goes there. But even if you're listening on Spotify or Apple, I don't really get any revenue from those streams, but that still helps raise awareness. And if you're sharing that content, eventually people come to the YouTube channel or go to the, the blog and see the ads and whatnot or use the Amazon affiliate account. It doesn't really matter. Or buy a shirt. If you buy a shirt, then I will make sure there's a $5 donation donation on your behalf that makes its way to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. But you certainly do not have to use me as a as a middle person to get to the the conservation organization that you're interested in i i'm one avenue that you can use if you're interested in but if and, and that's why i did it that way so people could come learn about animals and then simultaneously participate in conservation without having to donate their own money which i think is sometimes nice sometimes people don't have the extra change to to spare which is totally fine so anyway conservation so know your animal progress your care, participate in conservation in some capacity. Those are the things that you can do as a keeper to make sure that you're at least covering the ethical bounds of your own activity. Though Those are, I think, three major things that you can do. And again, there are many different things as well. This is not the black and white answer. These are just three things that I've come up with on my own. And then the the last piece, I'm not sure if this is the last piece, but I think this is the last piece of this conversation is the concept of what positives do the does herpeticulture have on the society as a whole? And that's kind of what we started this episode talking about. And that I said that sort of sounds like a grandiose idea or sort of an extreme idea is how can reptile keeping actually benefit the society around us? That's a very important question to have an answer for because even if you've done the, la- the three things that I just mentioned, know your animal, progress your care, and participate in conservation, that still might not be a strong enough grounds to, to, to go up to someone who doesn't think we should keep reptiles and just say, well, this is the three th- I'm doing these things, so that must mean I, I'm okay. They, might, they still might not buy it. I think we still need to make sure that we're doing even more than that. And again, those three things, think about how much more potency those have than just saying it's my right to keep an animal. 
Okay, it's your right to keep an animal. How about we, you have someone that goes, you have one person that says, it's just my right, so I can do whatever I want, hence the 30 stakes in my basement. Or you have somebody that can sit down and say, here's how I've learned about their environment. This is the specific region of the world that these animals come from. Here's how I've replicated it in their natural environment. Here's the behaviors that I'm now seeing because I replicated their natural environment in captivity. Here's how I'm participating in conservation. Here's how I've actually improved my husbandry from the very first enclosure that I ever got to the enclosure that I have now. That is... There's a lot of strength in that compared to it's my right to keep animals, right? There's so much more strength in that. But I think we can even add another layer to that. And again, that's the added benefit of what can we be a net positive in society? So again, I'll mention one more time. I'm going to give th four answers to this question. And I think there are many more. I would love to hear what you guys have to say. Come by the YouTube version of this video so you can add into the comment section or send me a message on whatever on Instagram or email or whatnot because there's more. But these are the ones that I think are are valid and the ones that I've come up with. So the first is an introduction to animals and the wild, right? I think one of the, I think the, a perfect business slogan that summarized this is Josh's Frogs. I had Josh on the podcast maybe two years ago now and, and his business slogan or his mission statement, I should say, it sounds better than a slogan, is connect with nature, right? That's that's their goal. Allow their, their customers to connect with nature. And that's what herpeticulture does for many people. Most of us live in some kind of city. Most of us haven't seen the rainforest. Many of us don't get to interact with wildlife on a daily basis. And, may, and, and that causes a downstream effect, I think, of having a disrespect for wildlife. Because it's, I shouldn't even say it's a disrespect. It kind of goes back to that letter that I wrote to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. It's sort of like out of sight, out of mind. If I didn't have these snakes at home, I wouldn't even be thinking about donating to the rainforest conservation because it just wouldn't come. It's not because I'm evil. It just It just doesn't come to my mind. But having these animals in captivity gives people the int option to interact with animals. And I've interviewed 150 people up to this point almost around there, maybe maybe not quite, 145, 146. And so many of them, when we're talking about biologists, vets, any of those sort of natural specialists, conservationists, so many of them, zookeepers, started with animals in captivity. That was their first interaction with those animals. And that's what opened up their their mind to what, the potential of you know the natural world is and the beauty of the natural world and having a respect for nature so it is hard to underestimate how beneficial it is to have animals in captivity that people can interact with on a daily basis now again that has to be linked with the things we did earlier the ethical keeping you can't have animals in, in captivity in horrible husbandry and horrible care because that doesn't they don't that doesn't flow from one to the other you can't have a an old dirty drawer with a snake that has stuck shed and then pull it out and say here's my here's my introduction to wildlife no it needs to be a much more holistic you need to be doing those three things i mentioned in the former section and then that's how the introduction to animal and wildlife works and that's where you generate a respect and a reverence for nature so the second answer to that question, the second answer to are we a net positive is the conservation and preservation piece. We've already talked about this that in the first section. So if you are doing that, you are helping. That is a net positive. There is, there is a, if we're all starting to contribute to conservation in some way, that is huge. Imagine how many people aren't contributing who could easily contribute $2 a month or 20 bucks a year, whatever it is, to conservation. That would be such an important thing for us to promote and say that we can accomplish like i said we have these passionate people who are obsessed with these animals and it would be very easy to harness that passion and obsession and convert it to donations and that 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 would that's a very solid foundation for us to stand on and then the other side is preservation so those who are those of us who are working with you know, I, I'm pointing at myself here, but I'm not one of these people. I'm saying those of us as in those of us in the herpeticulture community who are working with specific species and are a group of uh, a genre of species who are actually actively preser preserving those animals in captivity because their wild habitats are already so decimated and damaged that they need help, that there's a chance that in 10 years that all the wild habitat for this specific species will be destroyed. Not our fault, right? That's not necessarily the fault of, that's not the fault of herpeticulture. That's the, just the general, how, how the world expands, you know, rainforests get chopped down. I'm not getting into that on this podcast, but we could at least say, hey, if we didn't have this colony of preserved species here they would no longer exist we'd have to look at videos and pictures of them but because the private sector took it upon themselves to keep them and raise them and rear them and breed them then we have at least have them in existence on the planet it has nothing to do with rewilding or reintroducing them to the wild that is another concept as well i don't even want to go down that path because that's a little bit more complicated but at least saying that they're still on the earth i think is is pretty powerful 
And I think it's also really important to, to highlight how powerful the private sector is in these in these preservation endeavors. Because if you're a private keeper, you aren't surrounded by red tape from a university or a zoo that has these specific guidelines. You aren't surrounded by a budget. You know, the amount of money that private keepers spend in order to preserve certain things or keep certain animals is astronomical, as as you know if you're in the hobby. And you know, it, there's a there's a good chance that outsiders actually don't understand how much money we put, how much of our own money we put into making sure these animals exist in in captivity, and how much how important it is to us that these animals are preserved on on the land and or on the earth, whether in captivity or or in the wild. So, there there the private sector has an agility that the public sector doesn't, because the public sector, like I said, it's red tape. There's budgets. There's only certain things you can do. The private sector can do what they want, and that's where they come in. And that's what another again. That's the second answer to that question of what po- net pauses we have: preservation, conservation. And that sort of links to the third answer to that question is scientific literature. There's many examples. I'm not necessarily going to go through them here, but there's so many examples of of animals that are bred in captivity for the first time in the private sector. Just information about how animals are bred. This is the addition. The this is the gift that private keepers can give to the scientific literature. We actually have the ability to add to the scientific literature just by virtue of keeping. Again, those two concepts are sort of connected because we have that agility. We can learn. We can observe. We can do things that aren't necessarily as easy to do in a public setting. Lori Torini is a perfect example. This is a private keeper who has worked on snake intelligence and the ability to target train snakes. She has, I forget, 70, 80 snakes. And she's worked, and I think at this point now there's a published paper with her and, and a university because she is at the cutting edge of this snake intelligent concept and being able to train snakes. This eth- snake ethology is something that I think Lori is one of the most important people on the planet doing this work. And she is a private hobbyist. That is a perfect example of a private hobbyist adding to the scientific literature, which in turn has a net positive on on the world. Now, if you're listening to this and you have other examples of of private hobbyists adding to the scientific literature, please bring them to it. I would love to have a sort of a, a repository of examples of that. I can't I don't have them off the top of my head. Maybe I should have thought of them before this podcast, but there are plenty of examples. And like I said, the, the main one is understanding how to keep and breed. This happens in the pet the the private sector all the time. A lot of times zoos are coming to private keepers to ask for advice to how to make sure these animals how to maintain these animals. And so that is the third answer to whether or not we or how we can be a net positive. And the fourth answer to that is more keeper-centric, and that is this concept that keeping reptiles can give somebody a purpose and a meaningful life, which, again, sounds sort of like a more grandiose idea, but there are people who have reached out to me who who have admitted that keeping reptiles is the difference between them being alive and not. And it's because they're in a very depressed, very anxious state, and they don't want to be around anymore. But they found reptile keeping, and they found this this incredible passion and challenging project that makes them think and problem solve. And then they have a being that relies on them. And they're, it, it's impossible to underestimate or understate how important that side of the hobby is for people. Now, I could see an outsider going, well, you you know, how is that fair to the animal? You're using that animal as like an antidepressant or using that animal just to get out of your own your own issues. Well, again, this goes back to the fact that we're all nested within a community. If 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 the if your neighbor is in a deeply depressed state, when you interact with them, you're going to have a worse day cuz they're not going to be nice to you. When that depressed person goes to the grocery store they're not going to be nice to the cashier and the cashier is going to have a bad day and then she might not be nice to the next person and it sort of ripples through the society i don't think it's a i don't think it's an exaggeration to say that if you have people in your society if 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 people in your society are more happy the entire society is happier (laughs) which it's i guess is an incredibly obvious statement I, i guess it's not controversial at all and it's because people interact with each other. We're nested within a society. You're constantly interacting with other people. If you are less depressed and more happy and feel like you have purpose and meaning in your life, you're going to have more positive interactions within your community. So that is another very strong answer for what how, how we can have net positives. You take somebody who had no guidance, 
felt like they had no purpose, no existence, no reason to be around. And you flip that into somebody who is incredibly engaged, someone who's doing research on their own, somebody who's bringing animals in and working with them and learning things that no one else in the world is learning about that is now interacting with other hobbyists and other keepers and, and, and pushing themselves socially and being able to talk with people more confidently. That is so important that, that we want that. We want everybody to have something in their life that, that gives that to them. And, if you're listening to this and you don't keep reptiles, that's probably not happening. But if you are, you might be surprised how many people use herpeticulture for that reason. It doesn't mean they're taking advantage of the animals because at this point, I hope they're following the other things, right? Knowing your animal, participating in progression of care, participating in conservation if you have the money to do so. And then they're doing that and then they're also giving themselves a more purposeful life and allowing them to have a positive interaction with the community around them. Again, you cannot underestimate how valuable that is. So just to summarize those four points, there's the introduction of animals giving you a a respect for wildlife. There's an addition to the scientific literature. There's conservation and preservation. And then there's giving keepers a purpose. So that's four different ideas of, of how we are a net positive in our society. Okay, and again, that's layered on top of the of already making sure that your ducks are in order, and making sure that the animals that you keep at home are being ethically cared for, which we talked about by knowing your animal, progressing your care, and participating in conservation. Again, I'm getting, kind of getting repetitive at this point, but I want to make sure that I'm laying this out in a fluid and organized way. And as I'm just scanning through my notes here, there's one point that I meant to make about the keeping animals for giving the keeper purpose. That that reason specifically, I just had done some basic math here in 2020. Maybe there was around four and a half million reptile keepers in the States. And maybe it's more by now. And just imagine, imagine 5% of those people keep reptiles because it gave them purpose and it helped them get through a mental issue or a really life hard life challenge. And it might be more than that, to be honest. But even 5%, that's 225,000 people who keep reptiles for that reason, which means now they are in a much more positive state. They're they're going to be interacting with their community in a more positive way. Again, you cannot you cannot exaggerate how important that is to have that many people who are a little bit better because of reptile keeping. So anyway, I just wanted to make sure I put that in there. I hope my math is right. Maybe I'll confirm my math is right before I add this in. But anyway, so that, that sort of tightens up all of those points. Again, ethical keeping on your part and what positives we have as a hobby. Now, I think I'm going to wrap this up. I somehow actually got through this in one sitting and there's a chance that when I listen to it back, I'm going to be missing things or I feel like I could explain things more. So maybe I'll come back another day and add stuff to it before I before I release it. But again, I hope that this lays out, lays out a, again, that guiding philosophy, which is do what is best for the animal, both wild and captive. Again, help promote the message that we are a positive net force in society and see ourselves, see ourselves on that larger scale. Again, put yourself back on that witness stand in the courtroom and, and have a good answer for why, if it's ethical to keep animals. We want outsiders to look in and go, those people are up to some amazing, interesting things and they are conscientious and proactive and intelligent and sophisticated and they're doing things that are a positive on the earth and it's not just a sort of a mess of animals on Kijiji and Craigslist. Now, we, we also have to admit there are absolute negatives to keeping animals in ca- captivity, right? We've talked about revoking the freedom, but but also the horrible care that ends up happening to many animals, right? The, the horrible husbandry, this these conditions that animals end up getting put into can be really heartbreaking. And we don't want to be turning a blind eye to those, but I think promoting these messages, making sure that when we do bring new keepers into the fold, that we're promoting at least some concept of these messages, maybe starting simple with those three things that you can do, knowing your animal, progressing your care, and starting with some conservation type mindsets. I mean, you're not going to get a 12 year old kid with a leopard gecko to start donating to conservation, but you can certainly talk about it, right? And so it is our duty to make sure that our positives are a, are outweighing the negatives probably at least fivefold, tenfold. I mean, that's more of an arbitrary statement, but we want it, we don't want there to be any question whether or not this is the ethical thing to do. And again, as I said at the beginning, I'm not saying that so we can just unduly justify keeping reptiles for our own selfish needs. I'm doing that so I'm saying that so we make sure that what we are participating in is moral and is ethical and i think we all would we all want that we all desperately want to make sure that what we're doing is is a benefit to the world and i think we are and i hopefully i've laid out some ideas here that connect with you and and add to that conversation and i said and as i said a million times in this episode already these are not the black and white answers to things these are just 
some suggestions. This is some of the thinking that I've done on the topic. I would love to hear what you have to say about it as well. And there are many answers here. So, so add some answers, add to the conversation. And that is how we continue to progress herpeticulture forward. Again, we don't want to be stuck in these ruts of doing the same things over and over, making morphs and just getting stuck in this way we've done things for 30 years. We want to be able to defend this hobby in a powerful way that speaks to those who don't keep animals. I think that's the I think that's the way to wrap this up. Imagine you're talking to people who don't keep animals. You have to bring more to the table than interesting morphs and interest and and, and rack systems that can allow you to keep animals. Again, I hate just banging on the on the rack and the the ball python morph thing, but it it is it is a stagnant area of progression. I think that's the easiest way to put it. So anyway, I think I'm going to wrap this up because I, I somehow got through this whole thing. I'm not sure how long it is. I've been recording this podcast for over two hours at this point. For those who want to know how much editing takes place, you'll kind of have an idea of how after a, we see how long the actual episode turns out. But anyway, if you found this valuable, thank you for listening. But if you found it valuable, share it, add to the conversation. Bring it to other members of the herpeticulture community that that you enjoy or that that you interact with because that would be hugely beneficial. And if you are interested in learning more about this podcast or any other podcast, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. There you will find this podcast as well as the other podcasts that are on this network. If you would like to support this podcast financially, you can do that over on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash animalsathome. There you have access to the Discord channel and you'll be able to interact with other keepers who are like-minded. All the stuff that I've been talking to is all built off having conversations with those types of people. Thank you very much to Custom Reptile Habitats, who's the sponsor of this podcast. They helped me, Paul helped me set up this incredible set that's behind me. For those who are, if this is your first time here, we're not quite done. There's lots more to do here, but we will get to that at some point. And if you do, if you are looking for a new enclosure, make sure you head to the link in the YouTube description or the show notes, or just head to animalsathome.ca slash CRH. That's an affiliate link. So if you do make a purchase, a small commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. And I think that is it. That what my throat is dry. I feel like I've been talking forever, so we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you so much for listening. I do really, really appreciate it, and we'll see you guys in the next video.